I'm going to talk to you about some work we've been doing over the last couple of years looking at uh, sex ratios in different components of the sea trout run on the River Tamar. And uh, this work is a collaboration between ourselves, the Environment Agency, with funding from the Atlantic Salmon Trust, and I'm going to throw in some work that uh, we're just starting with the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust on uh, looking at um, the sex ratios of the Frome sea trout run. So, why do we want to look at the Tamar? It's a great river. It's one of the Environment Agency index rivers in England. Uh, extensive electrofishing surveys over the whole catchment looking at juvenile densities. There is a smolt trap run every spring, trapping salmon and sea trout smolt migrating downriver. And they've got a fish trap on a weir at the tidal limit of the river where they catch uh, a large number of returning adult salmon and sea trout, taking lengths, weights, scale samples, other biological data. So it's a fantastic river on which to do any research on salmon and sea trout. Uh, on the Tamar, average runs somewhere between about eight, or eight and 10,000 sea trout a year. Peak run between June and July, and we get a transition from early part of the year, uh, multiple spawning fish coming into the river, and later in the year, uh, school peel fish, which are to finnick or whittling to those of you who aren't from Devon and Cornwall. Frome, we've heard a bit about from Stephen. Uh, it's one of the Hampshire Basin chalk stream rivers, and again, they've got an extensive monitoring program looking at um, mainly at the salmon, but they've started looking at sea trout as well. They've got a um, nice system here. They've got a bubble screen that diverts smolts down this stream. They've got a nice set of pit, uh, pit tag readers. They run a small trap and again, taking biological information on the, on the fish that they catch. So, how do you determine sex in a trout? Well, it's not always easy to do. In juvenile fish, smolts, and in finnick, the secondary sex characteristics haven't always developed, so you can't tell from just looking at the fish what sex it is. So you usually have to sacrifice the fish. And for fishermen, this is probably not a popular thing to do. To get a statistically relevant sample of fish, we probably need about three, three or 400 fish. Now, for a 100,000 uh, fish smolt run, taking 300 isn't going to do a lot, but taking 300 fish out of a 1,000 fish um, adult run, fishermen are not going to be happy. You don't get the eggs for the next generation. It has knock-on effect. So, ideally, we need a non-invasive way of determining sex. And in the last couple of years, uh, work on uh, rainbow trout, some clever people in the States have found that uh, they find the master sex-determining locus. And it is known actually is the sexual dimorphic on the Y chromosome locus, or we'll just call it SDY for short. And this locus is specific to male fish, so it sort of acts like a Y chromosome in humans in de determining whether a fish is going to be male or female. And we've got a way now of screening the sex of a wide selection of salmonids, including uh, Atlantic salmon and brown trout. And so this allows us to use a, an adipose fin clip or a scale sample as a source of DNA to determine the sex of a fish. So, what we did, we needed to do some testing, and we did this uh, with Rasmus from the Frome and the guys at the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. They went out and collected 44 par, salmon par, and brown trout par, the fish were sacrificed and they determined the sex by looking at the, for which gonads they had. 
They then sent a sample of adipose fin clip and scales to us, but they did this blind. They knew the sex of the fish, I didn't. And they randomized the, uh, the order of the fish between the fin samples and the scale samples. And then I screened these with our genetic test. So what you get, and hopefully you can see this, is that you, we use a positive control band that amplifies in both male and female fish. And that's this band here. So without this, where you don't get the male-specific band, we couldn't tell whether it was a male fish that failed to amplify or whether it was a true female fish. So we need this positive control. And so in male fish, we get two bands. In female fish, we only get one. And for each batch of samples, we run a negative control, which doesn't have DNA in it, to check for contamination. And we also run a sample with a known male and a known female fish. So we've always got those positive controls. And I'm happy to say with the preliminary testing, I got it 100% right. So the genetic sex matched with the phenotypic sex. And for some of these, we were able to get a sex from a single scale from a one plus par. So a scale that's only two or three millimeters long gives us enough DNA to do this test. So, going on to the main part of uh, our main project. So the, the project is, was funded for two years to look at the sex ratio of different components of this Tamar sea trout run. So we're looking at 2015, 2016. And the Environment Agency were interested in this because they wanted to start developing biological reference points for Tamar sea trout. But for one of, one of the fact, uh, pieces of information they need is the sex ratio of the different components of the run. And as a preliminary analysis to a project we're hoping to get funded uh, to work on, to do some work on the frome, we decided to look at the sex ratio of a different stock, so the frome, as a comparison to the Tamar. So our samples, the data set is 1,750 fish. Uh, we've also got a, a sort of an ad hoc sample of uh, Tamar sea trout smolts and a small sample of Atlantic salmon smolts as well to show you that this works on Atlantic salmon as well as sea trout. And we've got some smolt samples, but we can also look at what happens in those first few months that the finite component of the run are at sea and whether there's any, uh, bio, uh, any sort of sex bias mortality. So concentrating on smolts, but also looking <coughs> at that first uh, post-smolt stage as well. So sex ratio in the sea trout smolts, across the three years for which we've got data for the Tamar, you can see that it's pretty constant and there's no significant difference between the, the values for these three years. So the average is about 75% female. And for a species with partial migration, like brown trout, because they've got that large resident component, this is probably what we expect, that there's more females go to sea than males. For the frome, we can see that there is a we've got more males in the sample. And this difference is highly significant. So different stocks are perhaps doing different things in terms of the sex ratio of their sea trout smolts. Although, to point out, we've got a difference in the period over which the fish were sampled. So on the Tamar, the smolt trapping is primarily uh, undertaken to coincide with the, the peak of the salmon smolt run, which ne isn't necessarily the peak of the sea trout smolt run. So uh, the, the, the sea trout samples are sort of a, 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 an add-on that, you know, that they aren't specifically targeting. On the frome, they cover pretty much the whole of the sea trout run from the end of March through to mid-May.
So what I did that I took the subsampled the data from the from to coincide with the sample period on the time R, and we still have the same significant difference. So it's clear that as far as sea trout are concerned, the, these two different stocks are doing different things with their um, sea trout sex ratio. And just to show that we can do it on salmon, we looked at a couple of hundred salmon sea trout smolts, and unfortunately, Alan, it's not a one-to-one -one sex ratio. So, uh, and it's a long way from being a one-to-one -one sex ratio. So, uh, caveat on this, this is only two nights of the sea, uh, salmon smolt run. So we don't know whether there's, this is indicative of the run as a whole. So that there might be, overall the sex ratio is balanced, but males and females are running at different times. Or this could be indicative of the whole run and that there is some sort of imbalance in the sex ratio. So how do these numbers compare to what has been found before? And um, it's not easy finding data on sex ratios in salmon and sea trout smolt. And if anybody knows any sources, reports, whatever, I'd be happy to hear from them. But what I could find is that um, from the 1984 sea trout meeting report, a couple of values, again, female bias, steelhead in the Hood Canal, another partially migrating species, again, a female bias, and Spanish um, salmon smolt, again, a female bias. So our values are sort of fitting in with what has been found in other rivers and in other species. So we can then look at the finic component of the run and we can see that for the two years for which we've got data that there is a suggestion that there is a female biased mortality in the three or four months in which those fish spend at sea before returning to the river. So the difference in both cases here is about a 10% drop in the female ratio, in the number of females, and in both years it's statistically significant. So we can start to look at what's happening across multiple components of the run, but also across multiple years. Again, how does this compare to what's been found before? Well, in uh, Chinook salmon, uh, Atlantic salmon from the Nansa, which is one of the Spanish rivers, and in Masu salmon, there is, again, a female-biased mortality between smolts and adults. In Arctic char, there's a male-biased mortality. So other people in other f species have been fi finding that there is a, a sex-biased mortality between the smolt and the adult stage. Caveat on what I've just said about the Tamar. From work that we've done previously, we know that around about 10% of the sea trout that enter the Tamar are strays from other rivers. Now, we don't know whether there's a difference in the sex ratio between the true Tamar fish and the straying fish from other rivers that could be giving that apparent female bias mortality. So, one of the things I'd like to do is to assign the Finnick from 2015 to two, and 2016 back to our um, baseline that we developed during the ARC project and see we've got the sex ratios for those already. Is there any difference between the straying and non-straying component that would explain that uh, bias mortality? So uh, the idea of the project, as I said, is to look at the sex ratios across multiple components. But what we can do by looking at different years is that we can start to follow a cohort of fish through multiple years. So, for instance, the 2015 smolts, we can look at the peel finic component, but then in 2016, they're the fish that have spawned the previous year, and we can see if there's any change. So putting in 
the results that we have so far. So blue is the proportion of males, red the proportion of females. And you can see that there are changes in the different components. And we can start to follow this through. And I haven't got round to it yet because I only got the samples a few weeks ago. But, you know, in the next couple of weeks, we'll have data for the, one, the fish with the spawning mark they spawned last year, and they were the school peel in 2015. And so we can start to build up a picture of what's happening across multiple components across multiple years. So what would we like to do in the future? Well, there was a paper published earlier this year that seemed to suggest that the female bias in trout starts from the fry stage, that there's a male bias mortality from when the eggs hatch, or maybe even bef from before when the eggs hatch. Um, I've got a few problems with this paper. One, that it was done with hatchery fish. So it was done with different hatchery stocks and not on wild fish. So th these are the results for different hatchery-based families. And you can see that the majority of them have got a female bias sex ratio. I've looked at some samples from a previous project we had on the Frome. So this is about 300 um, brown trout sampled from when they hatched through to their first sort of five, six months of life. And you can see at least on the Frome, there's no difference in sex ratio. Uh, and it's a, balanced, it's a balanced sex ratio in this first year of life. And I'd like to see what it is in the, in the Tamar as well. So that's a, a possible area for future research. And also, now that we've got this test, we can go back and look at, say, at Stephen's samples that he's basing his models on. And we can tell him the sex of the fish, and he can possibly introduce sex as a factor into his analyses and see how that affects his models. So I would just like to think by thanking the Atlantic Salmon Trust and Exeter for funding. And there are, I'm sure this is a, a, a not the definitive list of people who helped collect uh, small samples, scale samples off the Gunners Lake, adult fish, and the guys on the from as well. Thank you.